Reading is a beautiful place, but it's also full of wonderful people. We have business leaders, community leaders, faith-based leaders, all of them working towards a singular goal, and that's to make this a great place to live. I wanted to showcase these people, give their perception of the place that they call home. This is All Reading. I'm here with uh, Dr. Aaron Seaton, owner and operator. I always like that, owner and operator, just owner in case. Operator, yes. It's not one of these chiropractors who owns a place but actually works in another area. This right. is an actual owner operator of the chiropractic place. Yes. So thanks for coming in today. This is number one. I know you're not nervous. No. But I'm nervous enough for both of us. <laughs> so, you know, I, we were talking uh, about stem cell. I'm gonna jump right into it. Sure. It's, uh, the most controversial topic I can think of is well, I'm getting like mixed signals with the whole stem cell thing. I, some people are saying that it's, you know, miraculous and other people are like, no, it's still unproven. It's not. It's, it's in its infancy, to be honest, in our country. We're, we're behind. Um, we had a very long debate discussion on stem cell. Mm -hmm. So stem cell, we're behind on stem cell. There's a lot of uses for it. And the whole concept, a lot of people don't understand it. I find that that's usually what it is, a lack of understanding. Um, you have a very simple concept, which is you have stem cells, cells that are undifferentiated. They are just a basic primordial cell. They are not a liver cell or a bone cell. It's just a cell. This cell, when introduced in any environment in your body, can become the cells of that environment. That's what it is. So if I say you have a knee issue and the cartilage in your knee is wearing out and we introduce stem cells into that environment, they can become chondrocytes which make cartilage and regenerate cartilage. So that's what's very exciting about stem cell. That's what I like about it is that we're actually, rather than just treating a symptom, we might actually be addressing the cause of that problem and fixing it. That's what I find, I mean, virtually anyone you talk to, that's what they want when they go to a healthcare professional as a solution. And a lot of times what we offer is symptom management and that's not really what they want. When I hear about it, it's mostly joints. It's mostly, hey, I had it in my knees, my shoulders. Yep. But I've heard some, and, and I, I, I kind of cringe because I don't know if I'm quoting, uh, you know, gossip, but no. I've heard some people talking about like shooting them into organs. You know, I've yeah. heard something about yeah. liver. Yeah, liver. Um, they're, they're looking right now, they're doing, starting to do studies on uh, Parkinson's, a lot of neurological issues. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, spinal cord trauma is a very big interest Which here. Is big with me. Somebody's had uh, quadriplegic, paraplegic. Somebody's had a trauma there, and we can regenerate those cells. There's a lot of interest, but it's still very new. It's just getting research behind it, getting funding behind it, because let's let's face it. There's there's a lot of money in keeping people in a chronic state of illness. I don't think I'm, it's any secret that most of the illnesses we see are now this chronic managed illness rather than how are we fixing the problem. Stem cells, if we can fix a lot of these issues, could pose a big threat to a lot of money that's been coming in year after year for certain interests. So there's always going to be a pushback when you're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars. So. You said that's America's. my personal opinion. No, I I, <laughs> uh, I have friends in the uh, pharmaceutical trade, and uh, they used to joke that cure is a four-letter word. Control is what you want. You want to control the disease, not cure it, because cured people don't. And I know it's it's real easy to bash big pharma, big this, big sure. that. Capitalistic society, uh, uh, just it's it's going to do both things. It's going to you're going to have incredible innovation like yeah. we've never seen, but you're right. also going to have for profit right. drives morality. And right. that's where we have the struggle. And those, and the idea that you, I, I think the idea that you can get rid of one or the other and just keep, you know, oh, we want the innovation, but right. we want this uh, altruistic no. approach. Like that's not how this works. No, it's not you real. Know? There, there is a, there is a give and take there. You're absolutely right. We have the, the capitalist society we have does drive a lot of R and D for the, there is a for-profit motive there that helps drive research and development, but there's also a lot of government funding through the NIH, National Institute of Health, that does also drive R&D and works hand in hand with the capitalistic society. So we have this, we have phenomenal research and development. It's just steering that in direction that it's not just in the interests of pharmaceutical or the drugs, surgeries. The, the big question, the big thing that I have that, that I seem to struggle with, we, we, we're having this conversation about healthcare right now in this country. Mm -hmm. We've had this conversation for a long time about whether to pay for it individually or whether to pay for it nationally. 
but rarely do you hear during this discussion, which is a discussion about healthcare, why are we not discussing the paradigm itself? You have 5% of the world population taking 50 to 60% of the world's drugs, and we are not any healthier. We're in fact the least healthy of the industrialized nations. We're the most obese. We have the biggest chronic long-term health problems of any industrialized nation. So how do we address the healthcare issue if we're not even willing to say the paradigm that we're using is going off of a cliff? Whether we pay for that individually or collectively, you can have that argument, but the reality is the paradigm's not working. It's just not working. That's why per capita, you look at Australia, you look at Canada, they're, they're half. Their cost per person is half per person because they're not taking all the drugs, all the surgeries, just constant procedure after procedure, intervention after intervention. That's my issue with the model we have now is, do you keep it where it's constantly about reimbursing medical providers for procedures or interventions? When do we start incentivizing health and well-being? Say I'm your, I'm your medical doctor and I get you to quit smoking. What do I get paid for that in our country? Nothing. What if I have a conversation about your health and well-being, your diet, and we adjust that? There's rarely a, a bill that I can associate with that health and wellness education. So we have a system that incentivizes procedures rather than actual health and wellness. That's a, there's a, that's a big flaw in our model that until we address that, we're really not fully talking about healthcare as well. I don't care what side of the fence you are on that, until we address that, we're really kind of just tiptoeing around the elephant in the room. You know, the two points that I think of when, when you said that, and I, first off, I completely agree, is one is that you do have to figure out how to incentivize it because the whole idea of what we said earlier, a capitalistic society, you lead in innovation, the problem is everything boils, morality boils down to profitability. Uh, and that's not necessarily a great moral code. Um, so we have to incentivize, financially incentivize good health. And that, to right. me, that's how you spin that model around. Instead of incentivizing controlling the disease, you actually incentivize curing the disease or maybe even being proactive and, and attacking the disease before it, you even get the disease. Sure. Healthy life choices. And you're right that uh, the conversations usually get hijacked by, for lack of a better way to put it, politics. It usually becomes this whole left-right thing when it's like, right. wait, wait a second. We're talking about the health of Every American, everybody, not just this group or that group or this right. financial. We're talking about everybody that that these things. And and so I don't know. I have we could this this could lead this conversation into politics, and I don't I don't want to do that because no. uh, then it really polarizes it. But I, I know what you're saying is true uh, as far as of the um, was it, it's not even what did you say you had the term for industrialized it? Nations. industrialized nations yeah, first that we world yeah. or industrialized societies. Where I, I just saw a special on opiate use, you know what I mean? And just yeah, well, our level of opiate use is, um, it's insane compared to the rest of the world. It's yeah. a highly addictive drug that is, that is uh, you know, you hear the term gateway drug all the time. I think right. if there was truly ever a gateway drug, it that's your that. gateway drug. Yeah. I know that I, I told you I have a spinal injury yeah. um, uh, from my military service. And uh, on more than one occasion, it's like, hey, we're going to give you these opiates. And, you know, I mean, that's it, okay. I'm in a lot of pain. But it's, um, I felt like I was wrestling with the devil. That's, you don't, because as soon as that wears off, now you need two of them. And right. there's a, uh, just a whole host of side effects, none of them good. Right. And it's like, where does this cycle end? Um, you're going to have to detox yourself. You're yeah. going to have to go through detox. That's how the cycle ends. And a lot of people can't. Or they transition, you know, if they get cut off, they, get, they transition to something else. Yeah. They have to. And it, and it can affect anybody from any socioeconomic position. That's the thing that's so scary about it is you can have a high, a super high-end attorney get hooked on these from an injury. You can have any, anybody can get addicted to these substances. They're highly addictive substances. And yeah, they're great for managing pain, but what's the cost? You know, what is the cost? Of, they're short-term of... answers and they're being used as long-term answers and that's... Well, right. and, and, and again, it, it sort of gets back to the paradigm discussion that I have, which is, is pain bad? We're always conditioned to think if I have a symptom, I'm supposed to get rid of it. 
Symptoms in many cases are your body's part of the healing and regenerative process. But every time you have a symptom, you're told to get rid of it. Even your kid, think about how this goes back to when your kids are sick. My kids don't take any medications whatsoever. They never have. Not one has ever entered my kid's body. So I might be a little far on that side. Um, but what are you teaching your kid if every time they have a snivel, a cough, a fever, to go take something? What has just been conditioned into your child? That when I don't feel good, I reach for this. Rather than, hey son, um, sometimes life isn't so comfortable. And that's part of life. Uh, if obviously there's a, a, a medical intervention needed, then we're all people and you should intervene. But when does that start? I, I would argue that we start that at the sign of the very smallest symptom, parents freak out and intervene. And that to me is dangerous long term. You're making me feel guilty because I've got <laughs> children's Motrin and children's Tylenol in my cabinet. And, and, and now I'm thinking like, no, I, I can see myself giving the speech. You know, pain is weakness leaving the body. And this is an opportunity for you to grow stronger. So I don't mean it like that. What I try to, when I, when I talk to my new moms, when they have their, their children, and, and obviously a very common concern for a lot of the moms is when they have a fever. Well, we have this basic conversation. What is a fever? Okay, your body's temperature is going up. So what causes that? Most of the time you'll hear, oh, the virus or the bacteria. Eh, wrong. You're, a part of your brain called your hypothalamus regulates your temperature. The minute it senses an infection, it turns up the thermostat. Because when you turn up the thermostat, a few things happen. Number one, your metabolism increases. Number two, viruses and bacteria don't live so well above 100 degrees. Number three, you start cranking out immune cells faster. That's why you speed up the metabolism. That's why you turn up the temperature. So the, the, the fever is not an accident. It's not a byproduct of the infection. It's a direct response to it. And we're taught to think fever is bad, get the fever down, rather than no, let the immune system learn to fight. That's what it needs to do, very much like a muscle. You have to work it out to get it stronger. So those are some basic things that always kind of tie back to my issue with the paradigm of health that we have in our society is that a basic understanding of a fever could help parents be a little smarter about decisions they make with health for their own children. And that affects the conditioning of that child throughout the rest of that child's life. You know, when you're saying that, I was thinking, uh, because just the way my mind thinks, is that these are things that should be taught as part of our, uh, an educational system. You know, it rather be than nice. my children, okay, who is the 13th president? And who is his vice president? It's like, hey, let's talk about health. Right. I think, you know, I think we hear uh, commonly that uh, high school kids aren't really taught personal finance. No, that's a not. big one. It's huge. And it's a huge gap. I would, I would say health and finances are, are the two biggest gaps that I've seen in the education system. And we've homeschooled our kids. Um, we do, we're, very proactive we homeschool our kids. With, we're very proactive with what we do. And sometimes I think homeschooling parents can get a, a there's a little negative, negative stigma there about uh, we're just keeping them home for X, Y, Z reasons. But a, a lot of the children I see are, are so much further along in their maturity um, than a lot of their, their peers that are in school that I've interacted with. I mean, that's just a personal opinion of what I've seen, but um, those are two big issues there that I see too, just personal finance and health. Why are they not being taught that what you put into your body matters? Whether you exercise or sit playing video games for eight hours matters, that, that, that adds up. You know, at some point, your body is very resilient, but there is a breaking point for everything that's mortal. You know, your body will resist smoking for decades, it'll resist poor diet, drinking, it'll resist all of our stupidity for decades. But at some point, you know, you're gonna have to cash that check you've been writing for a long time there, so. So there's hope for me, is that what it is? That what's that? There's always hope. I heard a message of hope in there. Somewhere. There's always hope. That's the cool thing about what I get to do is, like I love, like patients I, I get, they're like, well, aren't you sad that you don't get to prescribe drugs? No, I'm thrilled. I don't want anything to do with that. Not that it's wrong or that there isn't a time and a place, but I don't want anything to do with drugs and surgery. I have to help you naturally. That's what's so cool about it. It's, it's your body doing the healing when I'm adjusting you, your body responding to the care. That's what's so cool about it is they get, they get this sense of empowerment again that 
it's not always something needs to be done to you. It's just we need to turn on what's right with you rather than always try to fix what's wrong. Does that make sense? Address the problem versus the symptoms. Yeah, and then allow the body time. You want to regenerate millions and millions of new cells from this old injury. Well, guess what? That takes time. You know, we, we have a I want it now culture, and that's just not real, especially as we get older. It takes longer amounts of time for us to heal, but that patience and understanding will get you through. I mean, I haven't taken pain medications for anything. I, I don't take anything ever for years and years and years. And it's just learning patience that this is a process. Your healing is a process. Sometimes that takes a week, sometimes it takes six weeks. But there is a process, there are things you can do to encourage it, but you also have to learn patience. And that's, to me, part of being an adult. Your background obviously it combines uh, athleticism and academia. I mean, you went to school for, what, probably seven plus years? Yeah, eight, You were an athlete years. in college? Not in college, I was, uh, it's funny. You, you had an injury I though, was, right? That's how you got on this path? Yeah, I was training, I was, I boxed when I was younger and I boxed for a few years and that was the sport that I loved. Um, not exactly a team sport or something most people want their kids to do, but that's the sport that I loved. I enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed that if I got beat up, that's on me. You know, you're, you're in there alone. You're, you're in there in the ring alone. So I liked the fact that it was a very individual sport. Let's not use the term control freak. Let's just control freak focus is right. on you. Yeah, no, you're, you're right on the money. No. <laughs> but that's, that's what I did. And, and then I, w I went to school for eight years. Um, I did junior college and then a, like a pre-med, pre-chiropractic program that you have to do to get all your certifications done and then went on to chiropractic college for four years. But you told me you had like an injury you because you were on a different path. Yes, I and was. It was an injury that kind of sparked this. Yeah, I was injured at, it was, I think I was 19. I was 19 years old and I, and I herniated a disc in my low back that was horrible to where I was dragging my left leg. I mean, that's how bad the nerve was being irritated. Um, I was losing control of the leg. And I went to the MD and the MD was like, well, there's nothing we can really do. Just take medication and there you go. Um, so my girlfriend at the time was working for a chiropractor and I had, hadn't been. And, she told me to come in and see him, and so I started going and seeing him and just feeling so much better after I would get adjusted. I'm like, wait a minute, there's nothing we can do. And then he began to explain to me what, what, I was, what he was doing, um, how the disc needed to move in order to heal. The discs have very limited blood supply, so they need motion to get nutrition from the bones above and below. So if I'm locked up, restricted, not moving right, how is that disc going to eat so it was really cool learning this stuff at 19. I thought I was really smart on health and exercising, and then you learn these new things, and you're like, wow, this is amazing. So I was studying to be, uh, I was looking at the accounting program at the time, and another experience I had had was um, interacting with these accountants and just seeing how unhealthy and sedentary they were. They sat all the time, they ate like crap, and I was, and that was not who I was. And then, so those kind of two experiences really are what set me on the path to be a chiropractor. I wanted to move around. I wanted to be up and moving and I wanted to be involved a little more in, in health and wellness. Are you, are you, uh, you have any siblings, brothers and sisters? Yeah, three older brothers. So I was, okay, cause I was wondering if maybe this uh, background, if your family was very athletic and very, cause even at 19, even to go through these things, the fact that you picked up on those two things at 19 you know what I mean? The, hey, wait a second. I'm looking at their lifestyle and I'm not appreciating this lifestyle. Right. And just the wisdom of this person telling you like, hey, no, this is how you can fix your body. I mean, because I went through something similar and I wasn't as wise as you at such an age. So I'm wondering if maybe your, your family, you guys were. I was, it's always been there, man. I was, yeah. I remember being five or six, learning the meaning of the word entrepreneur and memorizing it. When I was 16, I was 30 years old mentally. Like everybody wanted to party and have fun in high school. I was getting up at five in the morning or earlier. I, my job on Saturdays and Sundays was at a local cafe, like a little hillbilly truck stop type cafe that opens at 5.30 or six. So I had to be there at five. So that's, I've always been mentally more mature than my age. I tend to hang out with people who are a lot older than me, to be honest. It's very rare for me to hang out with people my age. 
Well, you're gonna. That window is closing. Yeah, because, I'm, I'm uh, getting old now. Yeah, that's why I do those tough mutters. It's, yeah, it's an early midlife. Now crisis. that's what's known as a good segue. So tell me, I have a, a basic concept tough mutter, but give me the specific. Tough place. mutters or obstacle course type of training, Spartan races. We do those too. Um, you you can do anywhere from. Uh, like a 5K, which is like two and a half, three miles to up to 14, 15 mile races with all kinds of obstacles. Some of them have like shock lines when you go underwater and there's a lot of, you can get them as, That's awesome. as intense as you want. It's basically like going through a boot camp type training. But um, honestly, coming from boxing, I'm used to training for something. Like anybody who, who, who's been involved in competitive sports like that understands that when that goes away, it's really hard to train the way you used to or, or stay at that competitive level because without a goal line to cross or you know uh, an opponent to beat, it's really hard to get cattle prodded into that motivational level. So I booked those with my good friend, John, who's a, a, a plumber here in town. In, in our John group, Jones. John Jones, yeah, custom plumbing. Custom plumbing. He's a good buddy of mine, and we're like physically built very similar. We're almost the same height. We're almost the same age. It, so it's awesome that I'm like competing with my twin brother over here. And John pushes me to, uh, to train at a level that nobody else really does. Mm -hmm. So we schedule them together. How many and, do you do a year? Right now we've done, we did the, the local mud run here, which is a, you know, kind of more of a fun recreational. We have a, a Tough Mudder on June 10th. Our ultimate goal, we want to do, a, it's called a Spartan Beast. It's uh, like 12 to 14 mile in Montana at eight to 10,000 foot elevation. Whoa. Yeah, so we're, we're psychos about it. It's, we're pretending we're not getting old. That's so how we convince ourselves we're not aging. If you're gonna do something eight to 10,000 feet, you're either gonna to have to get what, like one of those, uh, what are those chambers called? The oxygen, the hyperbolic John chamber? and I are gonna probably gonna camp out in the tent for a month up at Mount Shasta, and just live the good life. That's the plan. A month in advance? Probably. How long does it I take to acclimate we're, the whole we're crazy thing? enough. Uh, typically what you wanna do is if you're trying to acclimate to, to higher levels, you need to give yourself a few days per thousand feet so if you are, you're gonna race at 10,000 feet and you're used to say 2,000, well there's an 8,000 foot deficit that you gotta gain. Mm -hmm. So you need at least two to three weeks and I would wager at least a month to be able to effectively train at that level. So anytime you go up in elevation, obviously the air is thinner, there's less oxygen and you only have so many red blood cells. So when you go way up to 10,000 feet instantly, your body is like, oh crap, I need to make a bunch of red blood cells because we don't have enough oxygen around. Does that make sense? Totally. So, well, I mean, that's what the acclimation process is, is your body just revving up, producing red blood cells. That way you don't pass out. Do you know what elevation Mexico City is? It's, it's, it's 8,500. Mexico City's 8,500. I remember when they had the heavyweight championship and Verdum this is, uh, yeah. fought Velasquez, and you know Velasquez seemed an almost an unstoppable juggernaut. Yeah. And I remember Verdum right before the fight saying in the in the buildup, he said, you know, you're gonna lose. You you, you should have been here weeks ago. You're gonna lose. Ver Verdum came, I think, a month in advance, rented a house, and trained for a full month. Yeah, maybe more than Verdum that. Verdum was Verdum was there for a, over a month, and he was at eleven thousand feet, if I remember correctly. He was above Mexico City and mountains even higher up, training up there. It was the same. I remember back when uh, Kenny Florian fought Joe Lozon yes, in, that's right. in, in Colorado, in Denver. Uh -huh. And Kenny, he flew there a month before the fight and slept outside in a tent. They made his, his trainer made him sleep outside. And, tra and Kenny, it, it's painfully obvious who showed up at the proper time and, and when you fight at altitude. If, if you come late, you're, you're gonna be toast. Yeah. I don't care how good a shape you are and at sea level, altitude is a whole different ball game. You said the Munrod local. What's is local like in Reading or where? Do yeah, you guys the Shasta go? Mud Run. They do it every May now. Um, Eddie Axner, he's the one who helps develop it, and it's put on through Everyday Fitness. They do a really good job. Every year, it's getting better. We had a great time. The obstacles are getting more and more fun. We're getting more and more of a turnout. I think this time we had, I don't know how many. I think it was twelve to fifteen hundred people. I want to say, 
It's it's really gaining in popularity. It's a one day event. It's super fun. To what do. does that encompass? The mud run. What is it? That mud run, you can choose to do the five five k or a ten k. There's going to be twenty plus obstacles, and these are a lot. These are not. Uh, they're challenging, but they're fun too. It's a family type of, of setting. It's not like a competitive Spartan psycho race. No so, electrical shock cords. No electrical shocks, but you have to dive under, you know, you have to go in the mud and go under wire. It's not barbed wire or anything like that, but it, oh. it's meant to be a good time. I know you're upset. Yeah, I was looking for I was a little, wire. John and I were disappointed. We were hoping there was like, going to be some, some bullets whizzing by, you know, something. Some photo ops here. I was going to go, yeah, that, now this is going to be viral videos. They do take good photos, but yeah. that's, there's no electrical shock therapy or anything like that. Did you say you competed in it? Just so it was just, it just went by. Yeah, we did. We were at that one. We had a good time on that one. That was kind of, it gets the juices rolling for us for the year. And we start, John and I are starting to book out some more events. Have you booked it for the Montana one? Or do you have your month lined no, up at Mount Shasta? No, no we don't. Just... And that's the problem. It's right now until it's on paper, it's just a dream. So I've got to get it scheduled. We were thinking of doing that one next year. What time, when does that go down? That one, I don't know. I'd have to look, but they scheduled those way out. Montana, you'd think it would have to be uh, summer months, right? I would assume it's, it's going to be go in June or July or something because they're not going to be pulling that one in February or something like that. What are some other things that you do, like uh, physical around the area? I mean, we, we're completely surrounded by yeah. uh, nature quite a bit. Three national forests in three different directions. But are there any other things that you're involved in locally? Yeah, well, I like personally... I. The treadmill is a kiss of death for me. I can't, I can't focus. I, I can't run unless I'm on a trail. And that's what's one of the plenty of those. great things that I love about living here. Like we meet up John and Sean Peters from uh, Peters Construction. We mm -hmm. all meet up Friday mornings at 6 a.m. at Topps Market, jump in Sean's truck and go right to Whiskey Town. And we pick a trail we're going to do. And we usually run about six and a half miles every Friday morning. And then, you know, the great thing up here when it's really hot, uh, Whiskey Town Lake's right there, so you can just jump in right after your run, perks you right up, come out. So uh, just this weekend, you know, we're up in McLeod camping, and there's a beautiful trail there. Cabin Creek Trail used to be called Squaw Creek Trail, mm -hmm. and it leads to the Pacific Crest Trail. Just gorgeous trail. You see all the water in there, beautiful ferns everywhere. I just ran that this weekend. So there's definitely no shortage of stuff to do outside here. So I do train at home. I converted my garage into like a CrossFit. I just mm -hmm. spent the money and said, I'll convert this. But I love being outside. I, I can't, it's hard for me to be in a gym now once you start training like that and doing obstacle course stuff. It's really hard to be in a gym. You just feel way more alive when you're out there. No, I like it too. I have a hard time with the oaks. This, this, the spring about a month ago, I was hurting. Yeah. Uh, and but absolutely, I like the outdoors much better. It's just uh, the big thing for me is about timing because you do have to beat that heat. You want to get up and get in the morning. I like that six a.m. I liked everything you said until you said six to seven miles. I was co hoping you said like maybe six <laughs> to seven hundred meters, uh, but you took it to the next level real fast. Um, but I'm thinking maybe I could meet up with you guys, and I could just maybe run the first six hundred meters. And then just kind of do it in increments. There's no judgment maybe. out there. You're allowed that's, to run what you want. Oh, there's plenty of judgment. We're, we, I mean, we'll on, tease you when you're not around. Right, okay, but, yeah, but when exactly. You're there, we'll, we're going to be polite. So it's not judgment to your face. Yeah, you guys have more integrity than that. Joey, it, we'll be you, right back. Can you believe this guy? Yeah, oh no kidding. <laughs> I, you know, you said in there the uh, the CrossFit, and I, uh, have you ever seen the documentaries on those? That the, like the fittest person on the planet. I'm have not seen sure. I've seen some of the games. I haven't gotten into too many of the, the documentaries. Tell me about it. Well, I just don't, I, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to, I'm watching these people and they're, it's incredible. It's nothing short of incredible. It looks fake. The, the, right. What they're putting their body through, uh, I think right. Reebok puts it on and it's a multi-day and multi, right. and, and I'm like, how can these, I don't know how they can do it. Right. I don't know how they can do it naturally. And I'm not hearing anybody say anything about uh, but they are in phenomenal shape. It's it's crazy, but um, I definitely have no desire to do any of that. It, it's the kind of workout that when you watch them work out, my injuries start to speak to me. Yeah. But I'm unlike you. I am quick to reach for uh, Advil. Sometimes I take uh, uh, Advil for just no other reason, just to, than the taste. You're kidding I'm just me. so used You're to. Just no, of course me. I'm kidding you. No, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> but but uh, but I, I'm going to try a little harder. I think I'm, I'm gonna, you've, you've motivated me. I've got an old Marine Corps t-shirt that says, uh, you know, pain is weakness leaving the body. I remember when the brainwash, I mean, the training was so good that I actually believed that. And uh, there was a time, but that time is, 
I also remember a time when I was uh, in jungle survival training, we were eating bugs and that yeah. would never fly. I, I, I send a steak back if it's not perfect now. So we're, we're miles, that, that person doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> I've been, we're going to go out to the lake this weekend. It's, uh, the rains have been, what a blessing, man. The, the last two years, yeah. it's, uh, it I, was I've, looking pretty dry it here was, for a while. And it was, we were getting those like, oh, it'll take. And I remember this right before El Nino 18 years ago, right. where the water was so low, the experts, and they're out there, it'll, it'll take this many years, right. uh, you know, to ever fill this lake up. Mm -hmm. And two winters later, it's right. okay. We have to flood the Park Marine area. Why? Because we have too much water and there's too much runoff. And so, right. I mean, if there was ever a time to get out to the water, um, it's whenever the University of Oregon students aren't there. Other than that, now is a is a great time to get out on the water. I guess I guess they were just there and they weren't as bad this year. So that's good. That's good. Yeah, uh, the bar was set pretty low last year. But no, from my understanding, they went out there and they they party. And I remember being a college student. Uh, we're gonna it's go gonna this. happen. Yeah, I mean, we have big, beautiful lakes. You're going to attract people there that want to party on them and get a houseboat, if not. But it was so nice driving over the bridge, going to McLeod this weekend, just to see the lake. Just, I mean, that's we're at the beginning of snow melt too, and it's already full, and you're just like, yes, yeah, it's so yeah. nice to see. Very, I'm very excited. Do you fish at all? I don't. I, 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 I like to talk a good game about and fishing that topic's and over. hunting, but I'm I'm really not uh, the man's man of reading uh, like the rest of them are. They hunt, they fish, and uh, it's pretty cold out there. Well, speaking for all the man's men, that's uh, about it. I started fishing this year. I, I grew up in Alaska and moved here, and and the fishing kind of let me down, so I took a a, a step away. And then uh, a friend of mine is a fishing guide. Oh, nice. And so uh, he he'd been you know, nudging me, come on, come on, let me take you out. So I, I got tags, went out with a buddy of mine, Jeff, um, and we went out on the Sacramento, just around Turtle Bay Bridge. Now this was last summer when the season, cause I, I, I don't even know the seasons. That's the other thing. It's like, oh no, you can't fish here. It's, you know, you gotta fish over there. Right. Um, that's what the guide's for. But it was awesome. We did fly fishing. It's the first time I've ever done fly fishing in my life. Nice. And we went out and, uh, you know, I told people my experience. And they were like, what? Your first time, it was all the guide. I mean, he's like, no, do it this way. He gave me uh, lessons. He obviously set everything up. Right. He took it to the next level. He, he, he moved the boat and he's like, see that right there? Throw your line right there. You know, this is the fish like to come in when the water swirls and, you know, right. And, and so anyway, we, we caught several trout, did a catch and release and it was trout That's season. Awesome. Oh, it was, yeah, it took great pictures and he, he bothers me bothers me almost every day with like, hey, we gotta go out, we gotta go out. It's salmon season, it's this, it's steelhead right. on the Trinity. So I'm, I i don't get to fish as much as I'd like to, but it re-sparked that, uh, that fire that got kind of squelched when I first moved here and went to Anderson River Park to, to catch bluegill. I'm like, <laughs> after, after halibut and salmon fishing in Alaska, yeah, I was yeah, like, no thanks. Know. But you know, that sparked a, uh, I'm not a hunter either, you know, right. I haven't, uh, but it sparked this thing where I, I don't know why uh, I have this sudden urge to go to Wyoming and shoot elk. I, I Around think here, you, you got to turn in your man card if you don't. And I'm, I'm getting close to the expiration date too. So Yeah. Well, no one pressured me. Just something about catching the fish. Suddenly I wanted to arc all the way to, yeah. you know what I mean? It's no, like I got the slap fight now. in an alley and then suddenly I'm calling out the champ. And I'm like, you're you know, in now. I want to know. They'll all Let's talk. You hear their conversations too. I hear the guy like, hey, I got this six point this and that. And you just have to smile and nod and pretend you know what they're talking about. But I don't. But all the guys around here are really into hunting and fishing, and I'm just, uh, so you and I are going to have to do it together then. I told my wife, I told her this, I said, hey, I have this, this weird desire to do this. She was like, what? And, and I said, and, and you know what else? And this might have been the red wine talking, because I think, the more I think about it, I think I... I, I about three glasses in. Yeah, I of. was uh, three three-finger glasses of uh, Pinot Noir, and uh, which goes completely with elk hunting. You're not supposed to tell people you drink Pinot Noir in Reading either. That's so just, it was scotch, and it was, uh, I think it was Ardberg scotch. It was which a is, local brew from a local brewery, and I filled a jug they gave me. There yeah. you go. So, uh, and I said, you know, I'm pretty sure if I kill this animal, because I'm, I'm, you know, I got, I'm, I eat meat, so I, I can't, I can't stand on I ceremony. And uh, I said I'm gonna have to eat its heart. 
Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, right when I kill it. You're going and so to I was kind of like, school now. oh, I was psychologically prepping myself. So, nice. I, so I rented Legend of the Fall. You know what I mean? You yeah, got to get sucked. Yeah, I was totally up, like, okay. Little Brad Pitt. Uh, yeah, totally. There you true. Go. And then, with it, which then got me a fight club, right? <laughs> oh, no. So I was like, okay. Netflix sent both of them, huh? M maybe instead of a rifle, I kill this elk with a knife. And uh, so then it, it just came full circle, and I realized I should probably just stay local and fish for trout yeah, with the fly fishing. You're aware yeah. of how large an elk is, right? It, yeah, yeah, within reach. Okay. Bigger than me, they they uh, they could they fight back, from what I hear. Yeah, but they're real slow, right? They're real slow and I don't they know. somber. So I, I could probably catch them in deep snow if I was running uphill. Got long legs. They got a reach advantage. If they start jabbing you, it's going to be a long night. I go to spinning class three days a week. So That's pretty good. You know what I mean? That's I pretty manly. I feel like I could probably... Wait a minute. <laughs> I, I felt that I, that's, that's, that's that boxer. That's the jab. You got to establish the jab you early. The, you got the jokes coming out now. Yeah. Uh, so no, I I I, uh, I I would like to race in tough mutter if it meant June tenth. If it was got a, uh, a stationary seat. bicycle in a room with disco and air conditioning. Nice. And they bring a towel where I go. They bring a towel with like I think it's uh, eucalyptus and mint, and it's ice cold. Very cool. And so at the very end, they come in with the towel. You're ready for Wyoming, man. I'm, I don't know what anyone else is telling you, but you need to pack and go to Wyoming and. I was the thinking the same thing. Their hand. I was thinking, but you that's know, that's the all the training you need. I can't find any first class flights to Wyoming, so I'm just <laughs> I'm kind of caught with this no peanut noir this on this flight conundrum. Unbelievable. Well, they're gonna have in first class. They're gonna have peanut noir. It's like, <laughs> apparently, you haven't flown first class. But no, yeah, I haven't. This, no. this isn't a Chardonnay flight, sir. <laughs> this is. This is, well, because you should know about wine, didn't you? You're Sonoma from Sonoma. That's the thing. That's probably why I don't hunt. I'm from Sonoma, so we know about, I, I know, for a I good know burgundy. about wine. Yeah. Like, it, you're, what do you know? know? Your wife will have fun talking to me about wine, but about I'm the wine drinker. No. I'll order elk if it's on the menu at the five-star restaurant. Yeah. If that helps With out. With a nice uh, Bernays sauce. Is that there the, you go. Yeah. No, I, yeah, being down there, I love it down there. It's every time you're... Um, Every time summer kicks in around July, I'm ready to go back and visit Sonoma. Just the weather there is, we're, we were spoiled down there. Yeah. Yeah, anytime I left that area, you're like, this is what people live in. Yeah. I went to Texas in June one time. That was a good idea. And it, you're like, you get off the plane and you're like, oh, I didn't know you needed gills to breathe down here. It's quite humid. So what brought you, so you grow up there, or how do you, how do you find your way in Reading? So you, I graduated in two, at the end of 2006. And we were, originally we were planning on moving back to Sonoma, my wife and I. We lived in Castro Valley at the time, down by Hayward. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about going back to Sonoma, but uh, my friend, my good buddy, Corey, uh, Corey Meyer, he's a realtor here in town. Oh yeah, he's, of course. Uh, I've known him since third grade. Oh wow. So yeah. So is Corey from? Yeah, Corey's oh, from Sonoma too. Okay. Yeah, we grew up together, went to the same elementary, middle school, high school, everything. And uh, he, he was just starting out in real estate up here. So he came up just to visit, and he's a slick salesman because within within a couple months I had a house here, and I don't remember how that all happened. So he's good. He's good. Yeah. So we moved up with because uh, of him, and you know the housing market at the time. It just looking at buying something in Sonoma, and so you're like, okay. So and this is 2006, you said? Yeah, the uh, beginning of 2007 at that point. So that's when we moved up here. So we've been here 10 years now. And years. how did you, did you immediately open up the chiropractic place? No, or? no, I actually, I did vacation relief work for the first few years that I was a chiropractor, just mm -hmm. getting more experience. I tried working at a couple of offices, um, did, wasn't a fit for me, the business models weren't a fit, um, so I did a little more vacation relief, traveling around, taking care of other people's patients while that doctor went on vacation. Mm -hmm. So it was very Makes fun, you get, to, you get to meet a lot of people, but my wife became pregnant with our daughter, and you don't want me gone two, three weeks at a time all the time. And I didn't want that either. So we decided, let's, hey, let's open up our, our office here. Did you start the chiropractic place just from scratch or was it like an existing practice? No, it was from common, scratch. Right? Okay. From scratch. We started in 2011. And I remember we had like a little closet. It was tiny. Our office was tiny. And we had, it was my wife at the front desk, my one table. And then over in the corner, we had our baby crib. And our patients freaking loved it. They oh, yeah. loved it. Our baby, our daughter, Abby, was just this hot potato that just bounced around from patient to patient while I'm taking care of people. People loved it. They Very nice. Absolutely. We're like, this is so cool. And we're like, why do you even come here? This is a little shack, a little shanty of an office. And they Not anymore. Just, I've been to your office. It's not small at all. Yeah, it's growing now. They're still Dana mad Drive. at me that my kids aren't there. They're like, where's your kids? I'm like, I got a business to run, people. I got to get, get to work here. But... Yeah. They're at home getting educated. 
Yeah, yeah, right. So now, your yeah. wife homeschools them? My wife homeschools. She helps me with the office. My wife is, she's solid. She's always been that, that way too. It was, it was really cool when we met her. You're fortunate. Well, yeah, when I met her, man, like, she, she basically moved in with me within a, a couple of weeks. That's her parents might be watching this. You might want to, we will edit no, they're that fine part out. They, oh, they're okay. happy about okay. this. Okay. She, like, for three years before meeting me, asked every Christmas for a new blender, a new uh, uh, this, a, a new pot, new pan. She was stuck. Pragmatic. Yeah, she was just ready. And then she moves in and she brings all this new stuff. And I'm like, this is, this is going to go over really well. She was just... She was awesome, man. It's never been work for us when, oh, that's we, when awesome. we got together. That's what was so cool about it. Yeah. And so how old are you? Tell me you have two. My daughter, Abby, she's five and a, five and a half. Mm -hmm. And then my son, Andrew, my little titan of terror is going to be, <laughs> he'll be three in August. Very nice. The boys are oh, I, I, hard work. You know, I heard that it's a consistent message. Uh, that the girls are easy at first, and then when they hit teens, things start to, uh, uh, right. emotion starts to take place, and so now it's, it's not, you know, but with the boys, they come out, you know, with testosterone or something, Guns physically, that it's a completely different, right. yeah, uh, and it's, I mean, I know that that's not politically correct right now, I think with the, the current, uh, you're not supposed to distinguish, so, but I'm going to say as a father of four, at two and two, there is a huge difference. difference. I mess with my girls. My two oldest are my girls, and I mess with them all the time and tell them, like, you know, you, you conned me into having more kids because, you know, they, I was like, hey, don't ever do that again. <laughs> okay, father, I shall never do that again. Like, this fathering stuff's easy. This is so Piece easy. Cake. I should have some more. I should do a favor, you know, do the world a favor and replicate myself even more than I already have. Just I need to feed that narcissism. And uh, so I did. And uh, my last, uh, my last kid, he is, uh, he's either, he's, he's either going to be wildly popular in prison nice. or, or he's going to be, he's, he's got it. So now <laughs> if I can help him channel it and focus it, uh, he's, he's wonderful. He's uh, physically, uh, I want to get him into jujitsu. Yeah. I have some friends that channel are it. strong enough. and just channel it and learn to, be comfortable with his his right. physical form, you know, because he's he's just very strong and he loves, you know. You say, oh, it's it's TV or it's this. Maybe so. I think there are some inputs, um, but my son didn't have those things. And I go and I meet other people with little boys, and just some of them are just the testosterone, or They're I don't just, know what it is. Yeah, there's so, there's something chemically going on there. Yeah. Okay, that is not. It's not like oh, that's a bad parent. It's like no, because I've. I've done the same thing with all four of my kids, and they are four completely different people. Yeah. They eat the same, they all eat, yeah. we eat the They're same foods, different. and they are, yeah, they've, so, before I had children, you know, the whole nature-nurture argument, I had leaned way heavier towards nurture. Mm -hmm. And then once I had, uh, you know, four kids and saw, just, no, it, nurture is huge. Uh, sure. But I, I'll, I'll concede at this point it's 50-50. Right. You know, because they, they clearly came out with personalities yeah. and physical traits. That, uh, that dominate how they interact in life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like one of those things we, I think we could have a, a lot of conversations and they would all come back to the same point of that uh, as humans, life is complex and we don't really like that. We like everything to kind of be, we're not machines, but we're pretty close to where we, right. we want this to be like, well, there's a good answer and there's a bad answer. Right. And it's like, you know, it's not that simple. No. You know, and back to how we started this conversation with healthcare and stuff about like everybody wants to politicize it, wants to try to make it this us them argument when it's like, no, we or have. there's only two sides when there's really way more. <laughs> or, or, or there's or, way more than that. Yeah. Or are you saying that, uh, you know, capitalism is bad? It's like, no. No. It's, it's a wonderful thing here. And when, when it goes unchecked, right. it has just like all things, right. it has a potential right. uh, for some negative uh, feedback. Sure. So, well, hey, I, uh, I really appreciate you coming here today. I know we're going to have to have you again because I know we're running out of time. <laughs> but um, I'm grateful you came yeah, by. Thanks man. for having okay. me. Okay. This was fun. And, yeah, it was. And we'll do this again. I guarantee we will. So thank you. Perfect. After you do the Tough Mudder. Well, like, I'm talking like within 15 to 20 minutes after so you do no the Tough shower. Mudder. So no shower. No. Just full stink. Yes. You got it. Just dehydrated, hungry. And I will have gone through makeup. Just oh, to, as a contrast. Just to really accentuate your...